Xavier. So it's my pleasure to be here and giving this talk. And now I've got to live up to what he said. So we'll see how we go. Uh, look, my, my idea is to talk about robots in the wild is basically the field robotics. And in, in a way, RoboCup is kind of dealing that you, you've taken the robots from the factories that were around, say, even 50 years ago into they scenarios could. where things they are could. not as predictable and structured as in, a, as, in a, as in a factory. What we've done in the past 20 years or so is to probably take, a little, take it a little bit further and actually take it outside into a real life application. So what I try, what I try to do uh, today is to give you a brief introduction on what does, it, what does it take to take a robot into the field. Uh, rather than a playing field into the into the into the industry outside scenario, I talk. I actually sort of it's kind of a life story. I'll give you some examples where I got the projects I had been involved in over the years, uh, more than twenty years now, and also try and draw in some applications that other people have done, uh, and then hopefully at the end you get some idea about what uh, what does the field robot mean. So here is my first slide. This is not. Uh, I don't have to preach this one to you all. You all have taken the robot in the factory, which is in a very structured environment, and taken it into playing soccer and playing uh, at home league or rescue. So you're no longer in a purpose designed predictable work environment. This is obviously a challenge for the intelligence of a robot. In a, in a car manufacturing facility like that, you can have, say, three months lead time. You can set up the robot, fine tune it to make it as fast as you could, and in the end deploy it. But you don't have that. That's, but all you know from your Robo, RoboCup applications that you still do set up during a soccer game or whatever. You still have to do some tuning. If you really take it to industry, you've got to try and minimize that. And if you take it outside, well, you've got to minimize the human interaction. In your case, you're interacting with uh, with an intelligent engineer, whereas if you take it to the field, the interaction has to be a little bit more uh, simpler for humans to play with. So what I'll do is basically go to a range of examples of robots in the field in many application domains. Some have been maybe 20 years ago, some like uh, aged care, agriculture, Peter mentioned briefly, are coming up pretty much at the moment. So mining and cargo handling are probably very old applications and these are all pretty pretty new. And I've tried to classify them into three different things. One is the robots that just move around, looking around for inspection or carrying some object from one place to another. And then robots that actually perform some real work, like a human uh, operator. And then robots that actually work together with people and supporting people. So, so these are my examples. <coughs> and the competencies really are exactly what you would have known now from where, uh, what does the world look like? Like in your soccer field or in the rescue arena, what does it look like and where am I in there? This is pretty standard, mapping and localization. Probably the biggest difference in between what you all are doing and what we really want to do is the robustness. You expect deviation from the norm. You're playing games and you expect robots to fall down, you expect other robots to come into your field of view. But if a, ro if a, if a soccer robot goes stray for a little bit, maybe that's not a real disaster. But if you have a real big machine operating in a real life environment, and if it goes, if it does something wrong, that can have disastrous consequences. So, so robustness is a key, and I'll show you one example where we actually really had to put a lot of effort in to make sure that the system is robust. And the high throughput. Of, of course, if, you're, if you have an application, it's got to be very quick. It's got to be competitive <coughs> in terms of productivity, and I'll show you some examples where this is coming to the picture. And, and the other thing is the usability. Intuitive interaction with people. As I said before, you, the robots, you need, to, you need to make sure that it operates. A, a, an operator without an engineering degree can actually, or engineering or computer science degree, can easily operate it and understand how it behaves. And it's sort of coming to us like your at-home league scenario. So here, here are my examples. I'll begin with uh, robots that move around. And, and the first example is, is this one, an autonomous container carrier. This is probably now more than 20 years ago. We got approached by a port operator to see whether we can build a robot that move containers around in the port. 
So here is the idea. You have a ship coming in, and on this and, and on the wharf there's a thing called a key tray. Basically it picks up a, this is a container ship, picks up a container and put it on the wharf. Once it's on the wharf, it's got to go into some kind of a holding area where there's the containers are stored. When the containers need to be dispatched to a user, either a truck comes along or a train, and something has to take the container out and put it onto this, this truck. So the challenge is basically how do you move these containers around? And this is, this is and, and can you do it with, with the robot? And, and here is the output. This is, this is the robot that got built to do that. Now there are about 100 of these in operation in Australia around multiple ports in Brisbane, Sydney, and Perth at the moment, I think. So it's basically a, the robot is, a, is this is a standard machine. Typically there would be a driver sitting in a cabin here, but obviously there's no driver now. What we've done is the, the team has done, including Hugh, who I showed the picture at the beginning, he was leading this project, was to put up an intelligent system to move it around. So in a way, you look at this, it's a simple world. It's flat and you're moving boxes. What, what, how, is, how, how, how difficult, how easy can that be? It's a very, it looks like a very easy problem. The challenge here is, of course, you have a machine that's moving maybe uh, 25, 30 kilometers an hour, and it's carrying uh, a load up to about 40 tons, and it's got to be operating quite precisely. Uh, in order to go and pick up a container, you've got to position the straddle carrier to about two and a half centimeter accuracy. And once you pick it up, you got to go and place it on a stack and you need to have the same kind of accuracy. So what are the challenges? So this is a good input to what we needed to do. This, this is a problem where we know where we are operating. So SLAM is not really required. Localization is the key. It's an environment we've been visited before. But what's the sensor you use? In a, in a real challenge in these kind of scenarios is that if you want to develop a system that is actually applicable, really important to pick up sensing so that they can be used in the, in the scenarios you expect the robot to be used. So here we are talking about a port and we are, obviously the Australian scene is we have reasonably good weather all year round. Uh, but if you want to take it to somewhere in Europe, you've got to be faced with fog. You can't see through this. So at that point, at that year, Peter gave a very good talk in the uh, early in the late uh, early afternoon on vision. At that point, we looked at vision and we thought, no, we don't, we can't deal with vision. Vision cannot solve this problem because at that point, the vision technology was was relatively clear. Even now, I, I need to think about whether we could have, have used it. But we picked a radar. It's a millimeter wave radar. It rotates around, and it re if you put things in the environment that reflects radar it gives you a range and bearing measurement to that object. And if you put these things in known locations, in the port we have light port, where we stick all these things in, we can get range and bearing to multiple objects that are in the environment which are at known locations. And then we can solve this problem as a localization problem. The difference here is not like your laser, you are not seeing all these things at the same time, you're seeing one at a time. So it's a, it's a slowly rotating uh, radar and we're getting these observations one at a time and we basically ran an estimator to, to localize. So, so this kind of simulates that. So, so there, are, there are things that are put in the environment and the radar is rotating. The radar returns a lot of rubbish. Anything metal reflects it and sometimes the reflections are very strong. So you need an algorithm which basically takes away all the spurious data. In, in this example, I think we found maybe about 90% of the data is, is, is unused, use, not usable. They are coming from things we don't know. So we had to have we had to have algorithms to reduce this noise and get a good localization algorithm going. And in fact, this is a side talk is that this is the first time I had to play with the system like that. And in the end, we actually solved the SLAM problem in this scenario. And that led to that paper Marian was talking about SLAM. But obviously in this application, we didn't deploy SLAM. We had deployed the localization solution because we knew exactly where things were. The more challenge was, how do you make sure that this robot is not going to do anything wrong? You're talking about a machine that's carrying 40 tons near the water. So the robustness is the key. So obviously we had, a, we had good uh, estimation algorithm 
which tells us the location of the robot together with its uncertainty. So we could tell that if things are going wrong, our uncertainties are going higher, so we know something is wrong. But there's more to it than that. We basically had multiple sensor groups. We had redundant sensor groups. We, we had a radar looking at reflectors, and we had encoders coming from the wheels to get a location estimate. On top of that, we added a high quality RTK GPS unit, which gives you about two centimeter accuracy, together with the high quality inertial measurement unit, to get a location estimate. Radar is, and the wheel encoder is quite good when you're moving relatively slowly. When you're going fast, taking turns, there's slip, and this is going to give you a little bit of an error. RTK GPS is great when the sky is open to you. When you're, when you're under a fan, GPS doesn't quite work, and therefore you get a fault. But the interesting thing is that we, we have these two systems that fail in completely different scenarios. They, they, they operate on different physical principles. And then we had an arbitrator. So, so two systems are giving us a location estimate, and then we had an arbiter basically saying that if these two guys don't agree, which one I should pick? And we had a gyro basically telling you that. And we had quite a bit of work looking at how to detect faults. Because one of the things you, you recognize when you build a practical system like this, is it's going to fail sometime. The probability of failure is one. One day it's going to fail. The key thing here is that if it fails, I got to know about it. If I knew that the system has failed, I can do something about this. In this scenario, obviously, we. Uh, we can we can see the location estimate. We can see the differences in the logic uh, on, on the location estimates, and we can make a decision whether there's a fault. If there's a fault, what do we do about it? In in many situations here, we basically stop and get a technician to come over and try and fix it. Because trying to do obstacle avoidance going at this speed with the 60 tons or 40 tons is not a, not such a good idea. After we did this project, it, uh, so what happened was that we did a demo and the company picked it up, and then they started making many of these. The first deployment was in Brisbane, in Fisherman Island port, uh, a cargo, cargo port. When you, when you put 30 of these machines together, there are some other interesting problems come together, just like your RoboCup. So how do you coordinate these things? If you're people, if, you're if you have a driver on one of these, you drive along, you see another straddle carrier coming, you slow down, and you let it go. How can you get a robotic system to do that? Even more importantly, how do you do allocate tasks when, when a container gets dropped onto the wall? Which straddle carrier should go and pick this up? Where's the task allocation coming from? And obviously task allocation and motion planning are tightly covered. So we had another project looking at <coughs> coordinating these multiple machines. So the things that move here are the, are the straddle carriers. And then we, so it's a grid place planner, but it does both task allocation and motion planning simultaneously to try and optimize the throughput. Because in a port, the real key is, is the throughput. Okay, so that's one example where I really cut my teeth into, into practical robotics. It was run by uh, Professor Hugh Durant White, who was uh, at Sydney University, and now actually is the chief scientist of New South Wales. So he's going to do bigger, bigger things. And Xu Dong is one of my colleagues at UTS. Here's another example. Sydney has a, Sydney, Australia has, a, and, and many developed countries have a big problem in water, water mains. Much of the pipe network in Sydney was laid in maybe nearly 100 years ago. And these are all cast iron pipes. And the pipes break. They are brittle things. And, and suddenly they break and they create enormous damage. So here is an example from Melbourne. So you can see it's not artificial water fountain, it's just a main spray. Uh, so, so the critical mains when they break can flood everything. And, and in fact, we had one near UTS which flooded our car park and did a lot of damage. But how do you work out the condition of one of these things? They're made, made, they are made of metal and they're buried underground. It's in, in Australia, they're typically buried about a meter or a meter and a half underground. So without having access to the pipe wall, you can't tell what the condition is. So what's traditionally done is do you go and, if you suspect a man's line to be, to be old and breaking, you go and dig a few holes, you inspect it from the outside, kind of a sampling technique, just to see whether 
uh, whether, they, whether the pipe hole is corroded or not. But corrosion is a random process, so it's really difficult. So one of the issues they have actually is that when, when a pipe breaks, they go and obviously fix it up. The, the, the tool goes in, <coughs> shut the pipe down and fix it up, and then two months later, it breaks another 100 or 200 meters away. And this is really bad news for a water authority because you are basically inconveniencing customers repeatedly. So they came to us and said, look, I mean, can you build a robot to do something about it? What can, what can be done? So the idea down here is that when the pipe breaks, there's a short window where they shut the water and they have a bit of time to crawl into the pipe and measure the condition of the pipe wall uh, to evaluate whether there's another nearby point which is actually quite vulnerable. So, so we, built a, we built a machine to do that. Here the robot is not the important thing, it's more the sensing. What you really after is sense the, so it's like I call it a mapping problem. It's a mapping of the cast iron pipe wall to see when, see whether how much is corroded. The interesting bit is that if you see it from inside, it's all pretty good because it has a cement lining underneath, <coughs> about 10 millimeter thick cement line. So inside you can't tell anything. Even if you look at from the outside, the corrosion happens with the, the iron gets corroded, but there's, it, it leaves the corroded parts on it, so visually you can't really see it. So you need a sensor which actually can detect the amount of remaining metal. So we built an electromagnetic sensor to be able to do that very quickly, because you have such a short time to, to measure this. So what happens is that when a pipe breaks, they obviously take the old one out and put the new pipe in, and in between you have this pit. And in the pit, you have access to the pipe. So this is about 375 to 1.2 meter diameter pipe in general. So we put the robot in. It drives in as quickly as it can and come up with a map of the wall. Wall map, thickness map of the pipe. So, so here, basically, the colors tell you, give you rough idea of the thickness. And here, obviously, are really bad patches. So if you see many of these, then they know that you know, you've got to try and schedule a repair as soon as they can. Obviously, they fix the leak first, and then they go in and, uh, and fix the, go and attempt to fix that. So we built two of these. We built one robot that does about 100 meters up and down, and we're just building another one that does uh, 500 meters either side, so we can actually evaluate the kilometer. And we're talking about doing 100 meters in an hour or so, so it's a, it's a rapid, uh, rapid machine. So here is another one. So let me stop this one here. So Sydney Harbour Bridge is an iconic structure. You hopefully you get the chance to go up and climb it. Uh, you can pay quite a bit of money to climb it. It's a very nice view, I tell you, because we had the opportunity to climb up many times because we were testing robots on the Sydney Harbour Bridge. So the Harbour Bridge has these arches. The arches are box structures, and the box structure. This, is, this can be about 500 meters or 1.2 meters, and this width is about 600, uh, uh, six, sorry, 500 millimeters to 1.2 meters, and this is about 600 millimeters. So it's quite a small space. And they have this, it's not a, it's not a complete hole, it's got these things called partitions. So it's ev every six meter you have this partition bed, and it's got a hole in it, and it's called a manhole. The per why it's called a manhole is that it's designed so that a person can crawl through it. It's, it, it's quite tiny, it, you've got to be small to be able to crawl through it. But this is when it was built in uh, a century ago. Now you're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to put a person into an environment like this mainly because of safety reasons. If something goes wrong, you've got to be able to pull that person out in the, in the amount of time and get it to an ambulance. So, so the, the roads and traffic authority that maintain that bridge just cannot inspect this with people. So they came to us asking to see whether we can actually build a robot to do that. So one of my colleagues, I was involved in this project, Professor Di Tai Liu, and we built, a, we built a crawling robot to go into it and just inspect it. So this time, the, the pipe robots actually sense in the thickness of the wall. Here, that's not necessary. All the corrosion is pretty much superficial. You see the rust, and that's good enough. If there's too much rust, they'll go and repair it. This, this uh, corrosion, in an environment like this doesn't progress as much as in, in a pipe that is buried on wall, buried in ground. 
So here is a video <coughs> just to show you. So it goes into the pipe, build a map as you do in your RoboCup and everything. So, so and then it works out a path to move to, so that it can put the foot down to crawl into. There are lots of rivers inside, so you obviously have to find a good enough place to put the foot down. When it gets there, it's got to crawl through the the manhole and go to the other side. So, so this this got built and it it is now actually on the Harbour Bridge. They are doing some inspections with it. So it's got magnetic feet. So they're really purpose designed for the task at hand. It's got a 3D sensor, like uh, a depth uh, RGBT camera basically built in the map. So you're taking high quality images so that an inspector can go and have a look. So we call it like a street, Google Street View on the Harbour Bridge. So, so, so you got the images, somebody can sit down and have a look. So you can crawl through this and go out and come back to, to exit from wherever we inserted it. So that's been a that's been a fun project. Quite a, quite a lot of engineering challenges. Quite a lot of theoretical challenges in terms of motion planning and uh, localization in that environment because of the because of the way the environment is structured. And more so than once you put it in, it's got to do it all automatically. There's no way you can manually operate something like that. It's got multiple limbs, so it's 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 done all fully autonomously. And it's obviously got to happen quickly. So we so inspection has been a great thing. Uh, in inspection of infrastructure. The robot that moves around just looks around and, and collects information. When the images, so here is another one where we looked into, so here's a project that actually didn't quite make it in the end. Uh, I'll tell you a good reason for it. So RMS, uh, the roads guys came and said, okay, you know, we have all these bridges. Any concrete bridge has a concrete R. Normally it has a cavity inside just to reduce the weight because the whatever in the middle doesn't quite contribute to the spec. So that cavity needs to be inspected from time to time to see whether there are cracks in there. So you go in and you look at the cracks. So somebody crawls in. If there are cracks, they then go and do some marks. They put some choke marks in. A year later, they go in again, see whether this crack's still there, whether it's gone bigger or something, and just that's the, that's the way of condition assessment. And here the challenge was, is the, can a robot do it? Obviously, it's, it, it's easy to do, but it's not nice uniform sailing, it's got steps, so you need something that can climb up. So this is a packport, this is the packport we use with Claude's team uh, for rescue. So when they came to us, they said, ah, well, you know, why do we build a robot? We already got a packport. Why don't we put some sensors on it and go and have a look? And we did. And it's obviously easy for that. It's not as easy because we needed to do SAM in order to localize it. Uh, because once inside, you don't have any other sensing information. But we, we managed to get what we want. And then we <coughs> demoed it to them. The first thing is, how much is the robot? Is it 100,000 or 180,000 or something ridiculous? Uh, we, don't, we, we don't need that. This is an industry partner who worked with us for many years. But that just that message that we use this robot, and it is 100,000 or 150,000 just stuck in the mind. And, and that was the end of this project. They didn't want to, we said that, ah, well, it's easy to build something much cheaper. No, that's, that, that didn't quite work. Many other people around the world have done uh, inspection. So this is a slide from uh, Michigan University, uh, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor doing hull inspection. So it's underwater robot, goes inside, does slam to work out where it is, take images. Again, uh, mainly manual, uh, manual classification. People have looked at mines. I've been involved in a mining project, as uh, Marianne and Peter both mentioned. Mining is pretty big in Australia. Here's an example, mining vehicle. This is an underground, this is a Mount Isa mine, I believe. So, so you have these tunnels where you put explosives to get the ore. And this, this may be quite a huge, uh, quite a few uh, hundreds of meters underground. So what happens is that you, once the ore is there, you use these great big machines to pick up the ore and take it into a spot where it can be transported to, to the surface. And these are huge machines. You, you stand up, you probably stand up to so, up to so and so, up to about here. So, so they're big machines. And they're difficult to drive because they're as big as the tunnel you're driving in, quite, quite narrow machines. 
in some scenarios, if there is any <coughs> potential for explosion, OHNS doesn't let you have a driver in here. So you need a person who is remotely driving it, probably using just a camera. You can imagine the fun you can have driving this remote control vehicle <coughs> in, 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 a, in a tunnel, and they bash it. They really damage it because you don't feel it going and hitting the wall and, and you have probably half a meter clearance either side. So it's pretty easy to do. So many mining companies have been looking at automating these things. So this is called tramming. You tram the vehicle from one end to another. So it's just transport. Picking up is done manually and, and obviously the unloading is easier. About 20, maybe 21, 22 years ago, we were told to have a, I mean, we got the opportunity to have a look at it. Uh, Peter Kirk was involved in that project, Peter Dylan White was involved in that project. So we, we were funded to put a bunch of sensors into one of these to see what can be done. So at that point, we had no idea how, uh, what sensor will work. So we put a whole bunch of sensors, the lasers, the camera, ultrasonic, everything we could get our hands on. Put it on one of these and did an experiment to see what, uh, how can we actually take information out of it and how can we localize it. And I was actually involved in the localization part of it. That project actually was quite successful. Peter's team in the end took it to a commercial product in the, in, with CSR or in collaboration with Caterpillar. Now many of the major mining companies have these uh, LHDs, uh, load, hold, and dump trucks, automated. So this is a, this is a good, uh, good story in that space. There are already mining trucks that are automated. Uh, both Caterpillar and Komatsu, who are the big players in, in, in uh, mining trucks, sell these machines now. For They have been selling these for many years. There are some machines that are still manually operated, but you can see the challenges of manually driving one of these. You get all this dust and everything everywhere. Uh, so there have been driver assistance systems that was done at the uh, Australian Center for Field Robotics at Sydney University by Eduardo, one of my colleagues. We put these sticks and it measure, it looks at those uh, holes and works out whether you're in lane or something. So this has been, been a commercial product as well. Of course, you can't stop uh, without talking about self-driving cars. I mean, this is, this is probably the biggest application of autonomous systems uh, in, in, at the moment in the world. So it's a huge, as you know, huge industry. <coughs> A lot of funding has going into it. To me, this actually tells you what we cannot do. If you know about how autonomous, uh, many of the many of the many of the players in here use a high quality, high density map to get a localization estimate. And the location estimate they want is about five centimeters. So imagine going round in one of the Google cars or something and building a map of the environment using that Velodyne thing, huge point cloud, and keeping it. And every three months or so, they have to do it again in case that the environment actually got changed. So this really tells us that SLAM, although we've been working on this for 20 years, it actually doesn't work in this environment. If you could do SLAM, why do you want to build a high quality 3D map? So it just doesn't work. So in this environment, you've got to build a map. The other thing it tells you is that why do you need two and a half centimeter or five centimeter accuracy of location if you're driving? I mean, you drive, you have no idea where you are. You know where the traffic light is, where the, where the, where the pavement is. But these things need five centimeter accuracy. I think that tells me that you can't, we still don't know how to plan under uncertainty. If you don't know precisely where you are, our planning goes, goes haywire. This is even without thinking about predicting what the other guys are going to do. So, so this actually, to me, really shows a great opportunity to do some work, but do we want to do anything in this space is another question, because if you think about Googles and Apples and uh, Uber who are investing in this space with millions and millions of dollars, can a university compete in this space? So, I mean, at the moment, we're not doing anything in that line. Another thing that has happened recently is the Edo robot. I mean, you, you at home and, and, the, and the Toyota robots are good examples. From factories and warehouses where the robots have been used for maybe yeah, more than 30, 40 years now to transport objects. We've got robots in the home, mainly like the Roomba kind of thing. That's been, that's been a great success where things go wrong doesn't quite much. 
doesn't quite make a huge difference. But now the real thinking is that this is where the biggest, uh, biggest space is in commercial spaces, robots in commercial spaces. And here is, here is the example. So many startups in the Silicon Valley trying to build robots that go into commercial spaces for doing hotel bellhops to delivering uh, uh, things in a hospital into stock taking or inventory collection in, uh, in shopping centers or in shops. Uh, PAL has a robot, uh, multiple people, so huge variety of uh, startups are trying to do this. So all, all the same challenges you're facing in things like RoboCut have. How, how do I navigate? How do I go around people? How do I collect information about the environment? So they look, uh, they look reasonable problems to be able to be handled, and obviously that's why there's been a lot of investment. I think probably multiple millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of investment in that space. So now we took out the scenario, take, the, take away from robots that just move about and go into robots that actually do some work. So here is an example, again from the Harbor Bridge. And this is another industry example. Using what's known as grid plastic. If you want to clean a surface, if you want to paint a piece of steel, you got to clean it. And you clean it industrially using what's known as grid plastic. So you have a gun through which a high speed of high speed sand or high speed uh, garnet comes out. And that basically heats that and cleans it. This is true in it's, it, this is true in separate, in the bridge. We have to actually, if, if they want to repaint it, you have to take the old paint out, and this is how they do it. If you are a ship manufacturer, by the time you build all the parts for a ship to assemble the hull, they all rusted. So you need to go and do this whole big process of cleaning up before you do the painting. This is a backbreaking job. This basically, you can see the environment. You really get the, you, you have about 100 newtons on your hand every time you spire this up. And this, this stream can be actually lethal. Uh, it can kill you. So it, 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 on the bridge, when they do this, you have two people. One person to hold the gun and one person to hold the safety suit. And the paint, at least in our half, in many old paints has lead in them. And lead is now, as we know, is not very good for you. So it's a very, it's a big occupational health and safety hazard. You got to be fully kitted up so that you actually don't inhale any of this dust. So this has become a big problem for them and they came to us to see whether we have a, whether we can do a robotic solution. And I, this was a project that ran for about four, five years from 2006. So this is the environment. You have the bridge, you have the, so you have access to it, and if you're going to do painting, they got to cover it up, because so that the lead dust doesn't escape to the environment. So they cover up the region they want to paint. They put a wooden floor underneath so that a person with the gun can go into it. And then, I mean, our challenge is, can we put a robot in there and dust what the, uh, what the person, what the grid plaster does? Number of multi multiple challenges in here. They really don't want to change the way they operate. They want to do this incrementally. They want to get a robot or two into the system. They have a gang of 20 people doing this cleaning. Can one or two robots go with it to the team? So you can't, you're not able to actually change things very much, apart from the fact that we just put some, uh, some, some grid on the floor. That's all we were allowed to do. You don't have time to place the robot precisely. You got to just go and put it there. And this, this floor is no, there's no guarantee that's actually perpendicular to any of the grids or anything. The bridge keeps changing. The structure is different from a place to place. You don't have time to sit down and plan how are you going to do this thing. So effectively what you have is a robot, you, you go and put this robot in an environment and say, I got to clean this wall. It's got to work out where it is, where are the things to be cleaned, what is the motion plan that's required to do this cleaning and then execute it? So it's effectively a robot that programs itself. You don't have time to program this like in a factory scenario. So, so here is, so I don't want to go through the, the challenges. I mean, there, we had quite a bit of research challenges, uh, working out the environment, doing motion planning, working out which bits to blast and which bits not to, because obviously you, you, you try and blast the wooden scaffolding, it will, it will break and then do some collision avoidance on the run and do it all very, very quickly. And on top of that, a lot of design challenges. Obviously, you have this, uh, this heavy thing at the end of a robot and it's got to be moving around. 
So rather than talking through it, I'll just give you a video. So this is where the robot put in there first. It moves above and builds up the map of the environment. So it's actually got a 3D sensor in there. This funny motion is, is a motion planning algorithm to get the best exploration strategy. We're not seeing everything from one spot, but we know a bit about the structure. So, so we use the knowledge of the structure together with the information gathered to build up a map. Once the map is built up, and we use obviously some template matching because we know what exists, but they don't, they're not exactly the same all the time. So it, it, it needs to be reasonably clever in order to do this. Once you get the map, you do a motion plan. You want to do minimum motion. You don't want to switch off the blasting gun too often because uh, that's actually is a big delay. You switch it off, it stops for a while. And then we obviously wanted the operators on our side as well. So here what happens is that an operator goes and puts that in. He comes out and press the switch and he does all the mapping and motion planning and demonstrate to the operator what he's going to do. When the operator is happy with the scenario, he comes out and press the button and then he goes and does the blasting. So the blasting happens and then obviously it's got to be of right quality for doing the banking. So this thing got deployed probably about 20, like 11 or something, and we, we had two robots. We have two robots on the bridge that are, that are part of the blasting gang. And a group of people who developed this robot moved away from the university to set up a company, and they are, they are, they are doing quite well in trying to commercialize this into different, different applications. My name is Vicky Nostradio. So, so this is uh, this is the this is the mining project I got involved with uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Alan. What happens here is that you, if if you if you, I mean this this is uh, you can see the size of the machine. So this machine basically goes and digs a tunnel. And when the tunnel is cut, you need to support it, and they support it using prefabricated steel uh, arches. If you cut too much you got to put concrete in between to, to grab it. There's a lot of lot of wastage. If you cut too little, it's prefabricated, the thing doesn't go in and you're in big trouble. So, so they obviously wanted to see whether we can come up with a, a system to actually work out the planning, plan the parts, and then do the cutting. So this was a, this was a project with a local uh, mining equipment manufacturer. So, so we, we deployed it and we tested it in, in the mine in here as well as in Poland, I think. So Alan's been working on that. Here's another inspection scenario. Underwater. We have lots of bridges around Sydney and it's nice water, but then they get marine growth in there. So, so you get all this marine growth, these concrete pylons, and civil engineers want to inspect this from time to time. So you got to go in with the, with the high pressure water gun to get rid of some of this and inspect this thing for uh, cracks. So again, you need to use a diver for that, mainly because the marine growth happens in the tidal zone. So it will be, it's not too deep, but it's, 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 not, it's, not, it's not on the surface. So you got to go in and, oh, great. Okay, so I'm getting, uh, okay, so, so we built a robot for that and we just actually uh, finalized it and done, done few demos and hopefully we're going to roll it out. So we've got a few more minutes. Give you another example, which is not ours. This is an Australian company building uh, structures, uh, houses with uh, with a, with the robot. So it's a it's a big great big crane, and they have these bricks that are not the standard size. So because the little bricks are too hard to handle in this scenario, so they are, they're making a good uh, good go at it, and and got uh, recently I heard that got good funding to keep uh, keep working on this. So it's a simple, in a way, simple problem. But to get something like this rolled out to industry is really tough. So, so they're doing that. There's a lot of talk about 3D printing, uh, 3D printing of structures, and that's basically with concrete. So, can you squeeze concrete and, and build a 3D structure? Architects love it because you can get all these fancy shapes. The civil engineers are not that happy because you can't really get all the material properties you need in concrete uh, with, with this uh, with this thing. So, so there's a lot of work. I mean, the Swinburne. Uh, Melbourne is a, is a civil engineering team looking at how to do this printing. What is the what is the material you really need? Can you do this in cement or 
to be at something else to cement to be able to do this. Uh, I think this is a commercial advantage okay. is doing this. And yeah. young all this is uh, a big, uh, I think it's a worldwide uh, big uh, infrastructure company. And, and they're doing some interesting stuff as well. Again, a lot of stuff in uh, a lot of stuff in, uh, in the Silicon Valley trying to automate parts of construction. Try to take stuff which is actually being built for self-driving cars and can we actually use this to drive uh, loaders and, and automatically do stuff. So, so these, two, these two companies uh, that are actually startups doing this kind of stuff. Okay, so I think I'm going to skip two things. So here is an example where we have a robot with a person. I, saw, I showed you the uh, grid blasting example. That project was actually picked up by the largest grid blasting manufacturer in Australia, grid blasting equipment manufacturer in Australia. One thing they said is that, okay, I mean, the robot is all and good, but there are scenarios where you can't really have it fully autonomous. Can we build something to support the worker doing this? So here we build a machine that takes most of the load and provide the user with enough support and also it's not as easy as it looks because you got to be intuitively you got to have an intuitive user interface there so so much of the work was looking at what happens when this gets into near singularities how do you avoid them without upsetting the user who is actually operating it so this this project um, when we went and built this, and this is actually a universal robot. Uh, you are you are tank, so it can take ten kilos uh, load. And and what we are doing is providing just the support. And here is another example. This is from industry. This is a company called Zero G, uh, having this unit, which is with a robot supporting a worker doing some tasks on this. So these are, I think, uh, these robotic co-workers are coming. And as you know that. Uh, we have now these robots that are human safe. Unfortunately, Baxter, I mean, the Rethink Robotics is, is no longer, but Universal Robots and KUKA are the two big players at the moment, having robots that you can have, you can have with people. It's interesting how these things actually make a huge impact in industry. I spoke to a few people I know in industry in production line. The biggest thing they think about is not that it's human safe or, not, not that it's it's a small or you can interact with it. It's more that you can actually put this robot into a production cell without having to build all the cage around it. Makes it so much easier for them to get their approval. Make it so much easier to satisfy the safety requirement, which is paramount in, a, in an environment where occupational health and safety is a premium. So you obviously don't have to go through a lot of loop, a lot of hoops to be able to put a robot into the system because it's, it's human safe. So you can put it there, it does what it needs to do, you program it the same way as you have done in the past and it, it, it does a great job. The difference obviously, Baxter was trying to do a lot more than that, trying to do uh, very intuitive programming and actually that made its hardware a little bit suspect compared to something like this and that's probably what made it, uh, made it go out. Okay, so one more slide and then I finish. Doing things manually is very difficult in some scenarios. I mean, these are called wheel loaders. These are huge machines that are used in mines. Uh, in mines, just to go and pick up pick up a load of rub load of ore or load of rubber to transport. Getting a person to fill up this bucket, driving this, is is, is really tough. Uh, we I remember about twenty years ago, we went to a, went to university of uh, in a university in uh, Arizona. To, to, to a demo where you, you know he uh, the guy asked challenge us to go and fill the bu fill the bucket and you can get thirty percent of it once you fill it up and lift it up you don't want to you, you don't have time to do anything because you have the truck waiting to be filled up so both Komatsu and Caterpillar are have worked on this auto loading system automatically pick up a pile of rubber pick up something from a pile of rubber and that's really an interesting robotics challenge, how do, you, how do you do this? You have a map of this, but you have characteristics that are totally alien. Uh, it, it all depends on how much, uh, the size of the blade of this thing, and it's all different uh, sizes. So it's been, a, it's, it, this is another application that's coming. I think I'll stop there, Marianne. I'll leave this last slide.
Okay, look, that was really, really, really great. You know, we started the day with Manuela. She's saying we've got to have impact. We've ended with extraordinary impact. And I think the other thread uh, that Manuela threw out there was about standards. So, you know, this community, we are at the forefront. We're breaking new ground. And one of the areas that maybe we need to be thinking about is creating standards around safety and also security. I mean, robots uh, can, can certainly be hacked. So um, that was amazing. Yeah, what an incredible life and contribution uh, FISRA has made. And so I hope that you all got uh, some new ideas and were really inspired by the impact that um, we know robots can have. And in your careers, um, that's what we need to go after, and I think that's what Manuela was really um, encouraging us to do. She inspired us to do it, and I think Dizza has sort of shown us the path that yes, you know, it can be done, and by the way, it's been done for quite some time, so that was really extraordinary. And as I said at the beginning, he is a robot cover, right? So thank you very much. But uh, is there any burning questions? Yep, right in the middle, wherever the microphone is. Stefan, did you fall asleep? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta give him a hug. <coughs> right? Okay, so mm -hmm. is, is there another one that we can get ready for while we're waiting? Just wait. Hi, uh, thank you, Desert. Um, I have a practical question about the, um, the underground uh, mining uh, robots. I know there are a lot of uh, <coughs> hazardous uh, conditions uh, in the underground, um, things like gas, uh, maybe can trigger uh, explosion. So how, uh, how is that uh, situation uh, being managed? Uh, yeah. That, that's actually the trigger for this kind of work. So people have already, maybe even 20 years ago, had remote control devices that can be operating in that environment. So basically, if there's potential for gas explosion, if there's, if there's methane pockets in the, in, the, in the ore, the moment you break into it, it can push a 20, 30 ton machine two, three meters back and, and really can really, uh, that, I mean, can kill the driver. Uh, so, even, even that long ago, people, the, the mining authorities wouldn't let the uh, driver operate there. So that's when the remote control systems has come about. So basically what you have is a, it's effectively a remote control car uh, with, a, with, the, with the cable and a control station as you saw there. And, and the issue with that of course was that the driver was not feeling what's happening there. There's no vibration to tell you what's happening. You, you have just the, one camera looking at the environment, and it's, it's a really tough thing to drive. And that's what that's where the automation challenge has come. So in a sense that the, if you have something inside the mine, it's already intrinsically safe. Otherwise, you're not allowed in. I mean, we had a project uh, with the mining company years ago, and we wanted to take a sensor down, sensor into the mine. It's all nice and intrinsically safe, but we had the aluminum frame on which we had to, mount, we were thinking about mounting the sensor. The way when we went in there, he said, now aluminum is not going in. You, you can't do that. So, so, so things are very well controlled in that environment. So, so I, I think the safety issue is, is already in the system. great and, and uh, I'm sure you'll now think about the Sydney Harbour Bridge very very differently okay uh, it's very fantastic thank you very very much Lisa. now for the question. Thank you. we start with the last oral session and I hand over the microphone to Jack Lee. Yeah, thank you so this is a uh, session four I'm still looking for the 